imbued with history, shaping the nation's conversation for nearly a century, but never plain sailing. Moments of deep trouble where the BBC has to renew its bond with the British people. And one such moment has blown up after a definitive finding that a seminal piece of BBC journalism was secured through deceit. The government is watching the BBC carefully and a clear message today that it has to take the first step. I am obviously concerned by the findings of Lord Dyson's uh, report. I'm very grateful to him for, uh, for what he's done. I can only imagine the feelings of the, of the royal family. And uh, I hope very much that the BBC will be taking every possible step to make sure that nothing like this ever happens again. A Prime Minister angered by past behaviour, but pulling his punches on possible future changes. Boris Johnson's usual mantra about the BBC is reform, not revolution. And for the moment, he appears to be allowing the BBC management to lead the response and to ensure that this episode can never happen again. Ministers will be reviewing the BBC Charter at its midpoint next year and seeing whether further governance reforms are needed. They've expressed interest in a proposal by the former BBC chairman Lord Grade for a new independent editorial board. This would include journalists and could ask tough questions after programmes have aired. But the talk in Whitehall tonight is that the Charter Review is just a health check and that the current BBC board could be allowed to carry out the job of improving BBC governance. And of course, one big change in the last few years is that the BBC is now regulated externally by Ofcom. One Tory MP still wants major change. For many years I've maintained the BBC has huge power and authority without proper accountability and I'm not just sure that a, a, an extra executive board uh, is going to deliver that level of accountability. I think the individual should come forward. I mean, has Bashir used this strategy on somebody else during his career? Why did Lord Hall uh, hire him again and then promote him? I think, they, if not, there'll have to be matters to answer in front of a, a select um, committee. Quite ultimately, this, this um, issues less than this um, brought down the news of the world. I think there is an existential threat to the BBC itself. A former BBC manager believes the problem must be tackled from inside the corporation. The governor's system has been changed three times in the last 15 years. It's for the BBC to, to prove, not only to government, but much more important to the public, that it can sort itself out. I trust that whatever solution the BBC comes up with to the current crisis, it will be able to retain its independence on behalf of its audience, not just for itself. With a rich history all around it, the BBC is once again facing a moment of danger and a moment of soul searching. But the government is giving this generation of leaders the chance to take the first steps in repairing the damage. Now, Nick Watt is uh, still here. You talked about a health check. Now, how is the rehiring of Martin Bashir in 2016? How healthy is that looking as a decision? Yeah, so this is obviously a real challenge for the BBC because this interview was, of course, 25 years ago, but it absolutely plays into the president's presence because, as you say, five years ago, Martin Bashir was hired as religious affairs correspondent. There was great excitement at this hiring. Jonathan Munro, who was then the head of news gathering, now a very senior figure at the BBC, he sent out an email to BBC staff saying Martin's track record in in enterprising journalism, including time in BBC News and at Panorama, is well known and respected in the industry and amongst our audiences. A student of theology, Martin will bring immense knowledge of the brief to his new role. Now, James Harding, who was director of news at the time, who obviously was instrumental in that hiring, he gave an interview to the BBC this afternoon, and he said he did not know that Martin Bashir had faked bank statements. Had he known, he would not have given him the job. Now, James Harding left the BBC a few years ago, but in that interview with the BBC, he declined to be drawn on whether Lord Hall, who was Director General at the time, had been consulted on this appointment. Important to say that the Director General of the BBC is also Editor-in-Chief, responsible for all output, and Lord Hall did know about those forged documents. 
Nick, thanks for that. I'm uh, now joined by Giles Watling, Conservative MP on the Digital, Culture, Media and Sports Committee. Pat Young, a former BBC executive and chair of the campaign group British Broadcasting Challenge. And Emily Bell, professor at the Columbia University School of Journalism. Well, let's start uh, with you, Giles. I mean, your committee chair, Julian Knight, put out a statement. You're going to haul the Director General back in front of your committee. Uh, and there's talk of no repeat of serious failings. Um, and no one did their due diligence. What's, um, what are you going to ask of the Director General? Well, first of all, I'd like to say that, for, that I, I hold the BBC in great respect. I mean, for generation, it was, it was the go-to media organ for truth, honesty, openness. And I am so saddened by these events. And it's got to repair, it's got, it's got to mend itself. But our job at the DCMS is oversight. Now, I'm not going to second guess Julian Knight or what he's going to say or what he's going to, to do at the uh, committee. And, of course, we have to formulate the questions for the DG when he comes along to talk to us. But Tim Davey has a very good track record. Uh, when he was acting DG of the BBC, he, was de he dealt with the Savile case. He called those investigations together. And I, I have absolutely no doubt that he will do the same uh, here and make sure the BBC is fit for purpose. Just in general terms, Charles, I mean, do you think that the idea of uh, having management that targeted the whistleblowers and promoted the person uh, under closest attention for, for, for doing this, do you think that it is tenable? Do you think that their positions are tenable? We've had one resignation from Ofcom today. I, I think that there, 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 there's a serious question about the governance and there's a serious question about management in this. It looks from the outside as if people closed ranks. It looks as if uh, it was protecting itself. It's a monolithic uh, organisation and it needs proper oversight. Um, I think there may be heads having to roll in this case. And, and for example, the, I mean, you heard that from Nick Watt about, about Lord Hall. I mean, he still has public office at the National Gallery. Uh, do you think he should still be in charge of that? Well, I, 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 I no doubt that, that Lord Hall did the very best he could. But if he knew about these uh, disgraceful uh, actions of Martin Bashir, um, falsifying accounts, etc., then he should have acted and he should be called to account for that. Well, Pat Young, let, let's bring you in. I mean, you're campaigning for the future of public broadcasting. I mean, I think you recognise that this is a total mess and a crisis. Um, um, surely you recognise some of the concerns expressed there by Giles Watling? Yeah, look, it's been a devastating week for the BBC. Um, it, you know, it's not just um, the actions of Martin Bashir and the failure of management to investigate, but also the devastating impact it had on Matt Weasler and other people who blew the whistle. And that has clearly affected the culture. Um, but I also do think we need to keep it in proportion. Um, Panorama is just one programme within the BBC. The BBC is not Panorama. It may be, a, you know, um, news people might find that hard to believe, but the BBC is not Panorama. The BBC is but, television. But this wasn't it, it, just... I mean, this went up the management chain, though, no, as well. It, it wasn't just the management Panorama. Chain. It went up the management chain within news and current affairs. It did not go through television. It did not go through children. It didn't go through national and regional broadcasting. It didn't go through sport, radio, world service. So we need to keep a sense of proportion. Yes, it so, is serious and it is significant. But you're arguing it it's not systemic or structural. That's, that's what you're arguing. There was a structural issue within one division. Okay. And, that, well, and the people in that division have left. It's 25 years ago. I mean, the governance issue has been resolved because you now have a truly independent gov um, external um, regulator of the BBC, which we didn't have at the time. And so I'm not saying it's not serious. It is serious. Yeah. What, are you and saying the princes the are sort of over-egging this in their criticism? No, the, the, I'm not going to question um, the understandable anger of a, a, a young man who saw his mother die in such horrific circumstances and watched the very public breakdown of his parents' marriage. I'm not going to question that. But his brother also said that then and now it is bigger than one outlet, one network or one publication, and he's right. And so I do think there just needs to be a piece, uh, yeah, a sense of proportion. Emily Bell, you're a keen watcher of the BBC, the British media, for many years. Um, this I mean, BBC's been through some crises, but you know, the, an heir to the throne attacking it publicly on the ten o'clock news. Yes, I mean this. This is a bad moment 
Uh, but Pat's right, it was 25 years ago, and we've had big existential crises at the BBC since then, notably uh, the Hutton Inquiry and the whole David Kelly affair uh, with the Iraq war, and then uh, the Savile uh, affair. And, and it's interesting how often these um, existential crises boil down to uh, mistakes, um, overreaching, and in this case, actually out and out deceit around one editorial decision. And I think it's fair to say that if every organization that does ambitious journalism at some point faces a crisis similar to this, but at the BBC, it's, if you like, more severe because of the political nature of the BBC's existence in, in British life. Well, because the public uh, fund, it, fund it, Emily, because the public are obliged to fund it. Yeah, and I think that that means that the BBC has a different standard of care towards the public and it needs to have processes and cultures that reflect that. And I think by and large in the past, it has had those. The worrying thing about this episode, or rather the question to be asking is when this happens again, or when something like this happens again, are the processes there to properly frisk the journalism to give public accountability really uh, in, the, in the journalistic processes? And you would hope that uh, this hint by the government that they would allow the government, to, that allow the BBC to think about those internal processes and get them right is actually that that's the right way to, to do this, I think. Yeah, let me pick that up with, with Giles there. Nick, Nick Watt reporting there that maybe there's a sense coming out of government from his sources that the new uh, management at the BBC, the chairman and the director general, relatively new in post, that the government may... You know, give them the opportunity to sort this out. Uh, well, I think that, that I, I think that they are close to to uh, the, the workings of the BBC, of course. Uh, and and uh, I believe the new de director general, Tim Davy, has only been there since September, so he's only just got his feet under the desk and he's got to deal with this. But fundamentally, there is something wrong, and uh, it does look like there's been some sort of cover up. And the moment. Uh, this wrongdoing was discovered, the thing to do is to own up, own up straight away. Then you can be clear and then we can go back to trusting the BBC. As you said in your piece at the very beginning, it's broken the bond with the British people and it has to mend itself. It's physician heal thyself. OK, I, I but agree. Pat, Sorry. yes. Go on. No, I mean, I, I agree. And, you know, the BBC, um, we all had the, you know, I remember I was there when we were given the new values. Trust is at the heart of everything we do. And this is a breach of trust. It's a breach of trust with the public, with the audience, and also with the staff. Um, and so, you know, I, we talk about, I mean, Tim has only been in post in September and he was already, I mean, he did commission an independent report uh, from, a, from a judge. Yeah. He has published it in full. He's, un, he's apologized unreservedly. And if you've been listening to the BBC all day, this has been the only story on the BBC all day, and I can well, tell I, you to be... I should say, and other, and other channels, Pat, too. And but, other channels, too. But, are, but the are BBC, you, are the BBC you, uniquely This is not just self-flagellation here. Management. There's general interest in this. But, Pat, do you think... You, you are trying to defend... You think the BBC and other broadcasters are under sort of... Is that their editorial independence is under some sort of attack? I mean... I believe that public service... Here it's bound to rights, isn't it, the criticism? No, this, this is, as I said, this is one incident on one show, all right? You can't condemn the whole system of public service broadcasting because of a rogue journalist and a, and a, right, and a failed inquiry. I can see Giles disagreeing. No, I, I do disagree because it, it is clearly a, a fault in management uh, and therefore it's systemic. And so something needs to be looked at very closely. I, and if I it comes say, before the DC I, committee, I, we should do that. I didn't say things didn't need to be looked at. I said you can't condemn the whole system of public service broadcasting, which isn't just the BBC. It's ITV, it's Channel 4, it's Channel 5, it's S4C, Scottish TV, well, Ulster. I, I don't think Giles you is doing that, to be fair, but let's, let's bring in Emily. I mean, there's a bigger sort of vista here, is there not, um, of rapid change in the way that we consume media and the BBC's place within this. Yeah, I think that, you know, in journalism more generally. So if you think about the real threats that there are to journalism and journalistic independence everywhere now, whether it's uh, governments commissioning misinformation, whether it's uh, people hacking and leaking large troves of documents to serve their own political interests, 
journalism has to be on its toes and and in a defensive pose as well as well as investigating these things in a way it never has had to before and in some ways i think that speaks to needing to change these processes anyway uh even if there wasn't an existential crisis because you are just going to have to give much more accountability about your processes as a journalistic organization to frankly dis distinguish yourself from all of the other manufacturers of information who are out there now who don't have uh, that bond with the, 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 the public and trust is easily lost. You, you lose your reputation in a second um, and building it back is, is hard. Fortunately, the BBC has a massive amount of great journalism, uh, which hasn't um, got flaws in it, is done by honest journalists, but you have to have a process in place internally, which allows you to demonstrate these processes much more clearly, I think, to everybody. Well, Emily Bell, Charles Watling, Pat Young, thanks very much for joining us more to be said on that, no doubt.